So, people, it's that time again. It's in conservation with, sponsored by Leica Sport Optics. And also, here with you is me. <laughs> I'm David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder. And uh, tonight, this afternoon, this morning, I have a, a really special and interesting guest by the name of Kate Mulberry. Um, by the way, Kate, um, Kate, can I call you Kate or do you want to call? Yeah, Kate is fine. Great. Well, what I normally ask first off is how are you and where in the world are you? I'm very well, thank you, David. I'm, I'm in, in good health. Uh, I'm in South London, Battersea, um, just about a mile and a half from the river. Uh, wish I was where you are. <laughs> Well, I must say today um, here in Extremadura in southwest Spain um, was a little bit blustery, windy and, um, and rainy as well and slightly chilly. I mean, I'm talking about 13 degrees, which for people here is pretty cold. Um, but yes, I mean, I'd, to be honest, rather be here than uh, other places. Yeah, um, glorious weather at the moment. I have to say, London is extraordinary. It's uh, bright and sunny. Good. Well, well, do you have a question I want to ask? I mean, obviously, many people here may know who you are, but in the future, watching on YouTube may not know who you are and where you've come from. I'd love to know more about you. I mean, I know that you have, have written, uh, your first book was called The Fish Ladder, and um, it was shortlisted for the 2016 Wayne White Prize, and also selected as a book of the year in The Guardian, The Telegraph, and The Observer. And not only that, you are obviously an established writer. You, you contributed to newspapers such as The Observer, Guardian and Telegraph and The Washington Post, uh, as well as other magazines. And I also found out that you used to be a, a film TV uh, uh, film director. So, sorry, editor, should I say, editor. I mean, maybe a film director at some point, but certainly an editor. So what was that like and how, why did you make the change to, to writing? Well, I mean, I began my career as a trainee assistant film editor with the BBC. Um, at the time when everything was shot on film and I worked at Ealing Film Studios, I trained at Ealing Film Studios, which was glorious. I mean, I loved the, the magic and uh, the, oh, just the, the immediacy of film and that luminosity of working on 35 mil and being able to sort of hold it up and, and see it in the light. And then when digital came in and everything went onto video, which it was in the original days, but the magic just went out of the cutting room for me. I mean, having said that, I probably, everything I learned of any significance I learned in a film cutting room. Um, I worked with a filmmaker called Adam Curtis, who's made a lot of polemic documentaries that are quite controversial um, and rather brilliant. And I think it was his approach to material that has influenced pretty much everything that I, my, my approach to material I mean I approached it as though it were film even though it happens that I now work in writing after I left the cutting room I became a script editor um, I worked with Alan Breesdale who was the film who is the Liverpool playwright for about on and off about nine years and um, then found myself living in Barcelona because my daughter Eva had asthma she was four years old and she had terrible asthma. And we discovered purely by chance on a visit to some friends on the island of Menorca that she could breathe. So she went from being an invalid child in a sort of baby walker to this child who could run about and play within about three days of arriving in Menorca. Um, and so it seemed a bit of a no brainer really, you know, so we just literally lift up sticks and uh, went to Barcelona um, and then Working with Alan wasn't that hard in those days because Liverpool, Barcelona, they're, they're not that far away, as you know, because you live and work between Spain and here. Um, but I started writing because I was in an environment where I didn't speak the language. Uh, my daughter was at school all day. I was on my own. I was doing some work still with Alan, but essentially I was alone for hours and hours and hours in a country where I didn't really have any fluency. And so I turned inward not not in a bad way but in a you know go into your closet to pray kind of way I mean I, I had a quite cloistered life uh, and I just started writing it's not quite that disingenuous I am um, 
it was the year that the digital camera was invented. I don't know if you remember those first tiny little Sony and, and Olympus kind of little things. And you'd take a picture and it would go click. And then the thing that you were taking a picture of would just have left the frame because there was a delay. I don't know how many of you remember. It must have been about 2000 and um, probably sort of six mm. or seven at this point. And yeah, I, I think I was about five then. Oh gosh, gosh, I'm so embarrassed. You weren't, you're my age. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I'd gone on holiday to North Wales and I was trying to photograph, you know, my daughter playing with her cousin and in the sand in the rock pools and they kept sort of leaving and, or they'd pick up a crab and that would go out of frame. So I started writing instead. I, I actually kept a journal of that summer. And the fish ladder, which became the book that became the fish ladder, began life as an account of one summer um, spent with my family on a beach in North Wales, really. Um, and then I just carried on writing uh, and it just sort of began to grow. I just realized that actually what was in it might be of interest to more people than just, you know, me. It was more than just a journal. Um, and so at that point, I, I don't know, I go, actually at that point I applied to UEA and I went and did an MA in creative writing there. Um, which was interrupted because I applied to do that and then I got cancer. <laughs> so, um, which I only mentioned because the number of people who have subsequently become writers after suffering from serious illness, including in this anthology, uh, you know, we have the work of, which I'll get to, uh, Lynn, Lynn Roper, who was um, uh, a paramedic who developed breast cancer, but she, she swam, she was a wild swimmer. Um, Tonya Shadrick, Josie George, there, there are many women in this anthology, Holly Atkin, all of whom are either living with chronic illness or in recovery, Louise Kenwood, recovery from chronic illness, or it's something that isn't going to go away. And it focuses you, it's, it creates, a lot of creativity comes out of stasis. When you can't do anything else, um, it's not unusual for uh, people to become artists when they never were before. Yeah, it's interesting. We had a guest on um, last week, um, Scott Wiedensall, who was talking about migration. He's, he's written a book on migration, bird migration, and he was telling us that um, he got to the final chapter. And at that point, he was diagnosed with a disease that was basically fatal. And he was in this hospital bed thinking, well, this is it. I've got to finish this chapter off, um, which he did. But then straight after the doctor said, oh, by the way, we made a mistake. You're fine. See you later. <laughs> Um, well, I, think that, I think, yeah, I think the fish ladder, it was not unlike that because I started, I had started writing it as a journal. Um, I wondered if uh, maybe the, it, there was more to it. I think I'd, won, I'd entered part of it into a competition. I won a prize, a short story award. It was a thousand dollars, which made me feel very excited. So I thought, oh, I'm a writer. Um, but then once I got this diagnosis, I thought, well, what if I die? Um, you know, uh, for a start, it felt disingenuous not to mention it within the writing in case I died before publication, and that just looked a little bit peculiar. Um, but then I thought, well, what about my daughter, who at that time was only about eight, I think. Um, no, no, maybe she's a little bit old. She was 10, I think, when I was diagnosed. And, you know, I, I wanted there to be something, something that, that we were all in, something that captured uh, what life had been before this catastrophe because very often as you know certainly in your artistic life there's life before and life after trauma and many many things come out as a response to trauma um, and one of the problems with trauma is it can just obliterate memory um, you know my husband's mother died when he was eight he spent his life writing but he's never recovered a single memory of her. he doesn't look the sound of her voice the color of her hair he, he doesn't he remembers nothing about her and so I thought, well, if I go this way of, you know, <laughs> the bin, um, you don't, I don't want to, for her, I want her to be able to retrieve, uh, not out of vanity, not, not because I want to live on after my own death, but you don't want um, those things that people need, which ground you, which tell you who you are and where you come from to simply be eradicated. So then it became um, very important to me that it was as good as it possibly could be and that it became, um, uh, a sort of, you know, a hybrid, it's part memoir, part writing about the natural world, part relationship with landscape and part um, a child growing up. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. Um, 
Your current book, Women on Nature, um, is an anthology of women's writing about the natural world in what you describe as the East Atlantic archipelago, which um, I find as being a, a, a brilliant way of describing Britain and Ireland, essentially, yeah? Essentially, that's what we're talking about. Although we have, even though I did it to try and um, distance myself from, if you like, geopolitical boundaries and all that goes with it. Um, we did end up actually annexing, uh, in a true colonial manner, the Faroe Islands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because Sarah Thomas um, had written a lovely piece about um, whaling in the Faroes. And as she said, you know, it's, she, it's written in English. Where else can, what, you know, please can it be in part of this anthology? So we thought in a loose scattering of islands, then we have, yes, actually called, I think it's probably a different archipelago, but we've pulled it into ours. Uh, Fair so in terms of nature, I mean, what is your own personal kind of experience of nature? Did you begin life as a young girl rooting around the back garden and sort of running off, running off in woods? Was, was that your kind of upbringing? Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly it. I grew up at the edge of a green belt. Um, so the green belt is the green belt. And then immediately beyond that is a very industrial part of the northwest of England. Uh, so the petrochemical industries, Ineos Chlor, as it is called now, it used to be ICI, chlorine, uh, paint, um, a phenomenally dense industrial landscape, but surrounded by this, what I now realise is fantastically rare belt of ancient forest, the Mid Cheshire Ridge um, of the sandstone, what's become the sandstone trail that runs all the way up to Alderley Edge uh, in Cheshire. And I spent a heck of a lot of time because I was eight years younger than my brother um, on my own in the garden, digging up worms, putting them in jars, um, feeding birds. We had lots of birds because of this surrounding woodland. Um, when I wrote the book in the introduction, I say that my dad made a bird table and there were 17 variety of garden birds that came regularly to our bird table. And the copy editor, when she was looking at it, put a question mark by this and said, really? <laughs> because now there are about five birds in that you know in in the uk we we are so depleted in our um garden birds uh, and i said well actually that was just off the top of my head when i was writing the introduction if you really want me to sit down i'm sure there, there were actually lots more um but there were and i you know i used to list them every day when i went out to make sure i'd seen them all you know wood pigeon nuthatch um tree creeper green finch um, the beloved green finch, which I saw for the first time in four years last weekend. I mean, how mad is that? Uh, it used to be one of our most common garden birds. Um, I was allergic to dogs, so my parents wouldn't let me have a dog, uh, which was, of course, a source of extraordinary grief to me. But that did mean that I pretty much um, domesticated everything I could find in the garden. Um, I had a wasp hotel, which I kept in the garage. Uh, which was really unpopular because my mother was allergic to wasp stings, uh, but it was made out of packing cases and full of all the fallen apples. And I just used to, I had built this sort of system. My dad was an engineer, um, whereby the, the wasps would go, I, I put a bottle with a hole in the end. Um, right. The next door neighbor um, drilled a hole in the bottom of this bottle so that the wasps could be tempted in, but then they could never figure out how to get out again. <laughs> Uh, and I have to say, even until the house was sold uh, not very many years ago, so over a 40 year period, there were wasps nesting in the rafters above um, where I had had my wasp hotel. So I wasn't necessarily responsible for them, but um, uh, it probably wasn't the most popular thing I ever did. <laughs> and hand, uh, hand rid, you know, hand rid of thrush that fell out of the nest, and, or rather, the nest was pulled out of the hedge by some um, local boys. And so I picked up the babies and, you know, yeah. I didn't think anything of it, actually. You know, it was just, uh, that was life. It was like Bambi <laughs> in the middle. When I noticed um, mention of your book on Twitter, I thought I have to talk to this woman. Um, I needed to, I'm, I'm really happy. Thank you very much, by the way, for, for coming and Thank being on this. For asking me, I forgot that bit. Thank you so much, David, for having me. <laughs> No, but I, I, I saw that and I thought, because one of the things about in conservation with, I mean, one of the things I thought about when I first invented this whole thing was that I wanted to, to hear the voices of people you don't normally hear from, 
within the sort of broad umbrella of conservation. And when I saw what, what you did in this creating this anthology, I thought this this is amazing. I, I need to talk to you. Um, and I've got lots of really basic questions because I don't, you know, I'm very, I suppose I think quite basically sometimes. One of the sort of key questions I thought of, I mean, I looked at the list of uh, writers and, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredible list of writers. Some of the people have actually been on, on this uh, in conservation. But what was your criteria for inclusion? I mean, how did you actually go about thinking to yourself, right, I think her work's good. You know, how, how, did, you, how did you get to this? Well, to be honest, it, it was, if only it had been that easy. Um, I mean, I think with hindsight that probably when Unbound asked me if I'd be interested in doing this, they probably thought I would find 15 people commission 15 3,000 word or 4,000 word essays, and that would be it. Um, but unfortunately, my mind doesn't work in that way. Blame it on Adam Curtis and life in the cutting room. Um, and so, of course, you know, first of all, you've got these words, women and nature. That was originally a working title, and it just stuck. Um, it was a reference to... Susan Gittin's uh, 1978 polemic, feminist polemic, which was quite controversial called Woman and Nature, the Roaring Inside Her, that was um, questioning the, if you like, patriarchal and somewhat patronizing position um, that sort of Father God, Mother Earth, um, men are sort of logical and, and well, men and women are somehow wild and uh, untamable and in need of civilizing, you know, which was, I mean, that was the 70s and, and that was sort of how feminism, what it sort of had to fight against in the first instance. So, so there was a reference to her, but then against that, um, you know, this word women is now incredibly complex and has a very different and broad scope. Nature is another equally problematic term and so I realized that you know, how, for me, it's problematic because most dictionaries de define it as everything that isn't human. So rather than conservation or the natural world or wildlife, I, I was actually looking at the whole term nature, um, everything that is not human, whereas we are, so it's them and us. Um, it's inherently anthropocentric. It immediately puts human beings at the middle of the world. Um, and I found that very troubling. Um, you know, we call this era has been called the Anthropocene because of the damage that we have caused to it. It's the period geologically that has been shaped most by our actions. Um, and so then you think, well, you know, are we, we are a species within this. Um, and I just thought, well, maybe the thing to do is just go back as far as I possibly can and try and find uh, references to anything that isn't human. So anything that is in the natural world written by women because what we think of as nature writing now new nature writing in inverted commas that emerged around was it when granta published the new nature writing was it about 2008 something like that uh had writers like paul fairly robert mcfarlane mm. um i think richard maybe was in it and then kathleen jamie was in it and kathleen jamie wrote something completely different it was all about helicobacter um, bacteria uh, being like sheep on a sort of plane inside a body that was on the slab at the morgue, uh, which was completely different to the way the men were writing. So it stood out even at that point. Um, so whereas if you, so, so then I started to think, well, is this essentially a sort of male form that's um, not unrelated to travel writing, not unrelated to natural history? Uh, that what we've come to think of as nature writing has been defined um, very often by men who are often white and privileged and have gone out into the landscape and for one reason or another have had the time and resources to do that. Um, so what were the women doing? So I ended up going back right to and, and originally Julian of Norwich in her anchoress's cell. She was a medieval uh, anchorite, that is a woman who had was voluntarily walled up into a cell for the rest of her life, which I think was about, we don't really know much about her, but probably about 30 years she lived there um, with three windows, one into the church of which she was the anchor, um, one onto the street so that people could come and talk to her, 
uh, and one so that food could be passed in and waste could be passed out. And she had a creation-centered concept of the universe. Um, that is, she saw God in all things. She saw, and she didn't particularly, in fact, she didn't differentiate between male and female. She didn't see God as, well, she did see God as the father, but she also saw God as the mother. Um, she, she, I think she, she refers to Christ as, the, you know, the relationship between us and Christ as, a, as that between a child and its mother. Um, so immediately you have this, uh, you, you begin to sort of break down these gender things that we've got used to, but that really did not exist then uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, yeah, because the question was, have you? Oh, oh, nature. So yes, so so was it easy to find? No, it was really hard to find. So I had to go to the British Library and I had to go through every woman writer I could find historically and look for words like leaf and tree and flower and deer and fox, um, because there was no such thing as nature writing um, way back in the dark ages uh, when I began my story as we became blinking into the light <laughs> just before the early modern period. Um, but but let me ask you, why, why is the natural world so shaped by men? Why? Um, or, do you, or do you, would you agree with that statement? Why is the natural world shaped by men? Um, I don't know that it is. I, I think what we're doing is plundering it and uh, mining it. And I think one of the, and I, I think this is a fairly recent phenomenon. I think you know, the start of Timothy Morton, the uh, other controversial philosopher, uh, I think states that the invention of the steam engine as the beginning of the rot, if you like, the point at which we really began to have an impact um, on our planet. Um, I suppose you could go back further and say, uh, you know, when we started farming, is that when it happened? You know, what was the fall from Eden when we actually um, put a yoke on oxen um, and started to make the world revolve around ourselves? Uh, but it's really very recently in the last couple of hundred years that humanity has got way out of hand as a species. So you know, that idea of them and us, um, nature and people, uh, the point at which we stopped being simply one other primate and becoming something that has, if you like, tried to put the world as though, as though it's just a sort of banqueting table for us to pick at. Um, and I think that's quite frightening and we you know you people use cliches like paradigm shift but we really do need to make an adjustment um that's quite fundamental and so one of the reasons i put this book together if you like was there are over 100 people in it um they do cover about 700 years unevenly um half of the writers are still alive although some of them are far from young um, and some of them are very young. I think our youngest contributor was seven at the time that she wrote the poem that is included. Um, and the other half sort of come fill that other gap intermittently. But the reason I did it was because I wanted to, if you like, just throw up all the pieces in the air and let them come down. And the thing about an anthology is people very often will settle on a few pieces that they actually like, and then they'll keep going back to them. So you might decide that you like poetry, in which case you'll find poetry. You may be more interested in natural history, in which case you may be looking at Miriam Darlington or Helen McDonald writing about natural history. Uh, you may um, be interested in a first person account of, of being in a landscape. Um, you may be interested in recipes. Um, this is Mrs. Beaton's cookery book from 1862, I think it was published. Uh, on how to make mushroom sauce. Uh, and so, and there's an awful lot of gardening, you know, the, the, a lot of, the, of these women's, and farmers, we've got farmers too. And so a lot of what these women are doing is actually just getting on with their lives. They are scratching a living, making a living, being there. They're not necessarily thinking about the bigger picture of uh, conservation. And one of the things that making the book has made me realize is that if you actually want to change things, you just need to legislate. You need to, to decide, you know, cooperation between governments, goodness knows how it's going to happen. Um, but if you want people to stop driving petrol cars, then find a way of getting them into electric cars. You know, 10 or more years ago, when we're smoking banned um, in, you, you've probably heard this analogy, I mean, it's hardly original, but, you know, seatbelts. I remember as a small child coming home from parties with my parents who'd probably been drinking 
lying on the back seat of the car under a blanket and nobody thought anything of it. Nowadays, we would be absolutely horrified to think that you might go out and have a couple of glasses of wine and put your baby on the back seat and then drive home um, with no seatbelt. But, you know, someone clunk click every trip, somebody, oh, gosh, it was Jimmy Savile. Yeah, that's why I say don't mention his name. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, we all wear seatbelts. Um, smoking was banned in public spaces around 10 years ago. Uh, now we'd all be astonished if you went into a pub and somebody was sitting there having a cigarette. You'd think, oh my goodness. These, these big shifts have to come uh, at a governmental level, I think. And we worry a lot about making people like writing that is uh, important or political. And actually a lot of the women in this book do not write politically, they write um, from a very close observation of the world about them. Yeah. It's interesting to talk about observations because, I mean, for example, myself, I mean, I'm, you know, very much into wildlife, particularly birds. And when I first discovered that the RSPB, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, was actually founded by six women in Didsbury, Manchester, I thought, okay, well, let's go and look at their statues or let's walk down the main hall of the RSPB headquarters to see if there's any pictures of them anywhere and there's nothing oh, and they... I, I know they've, they've recently kind of uh, started uh, doing some kind of poll to find out who you know about statues but my question my question really is um i suppose in the bigger scheme of things do women do you think women see the world differently to men um that's such an enormous question. Then you come back to that, you know, what is women sort of question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just not well enough informed to know the answer to that question. I know that when I grew up, I didn't have any particular awareness of being a woman. I think, you know, I remember my dad saying to me that because I wasn't born in America, I could never be the president of the United States, but otherwise the world was my oyster. And so, I, so you know, I, my parents, you know, I, went to university, it only occurred to me afterwards, I was probably the first girl in our family to go to university. I, I had female cousins who'd gone to teach a training college um, and uh, to a polytechnic, but I think with hindsight, it was I was probably the first person to go to a university, but I did, it wasn't a big thing. I didn't know, I just, I, you know, I took it for granted. My parents didn't differentiate between me and my brother in what they felt we might have been able to do. So I don't know if women see or view the world differently. And you know, one of the reasons for making a book like this um, is really to try and find out. Um, some of the writing is uh, similar stylistically to uh, the writing of the male contemporaries, um, certainly the recent stuff, uh, but the older material, I mean, women, there, there's, far, there's a heck of a lot of poetry in here. Uh, so I think as a way of approaching the subject, uh, these women have often used different, and fiction, novels. Um, so perhaps the way of approaching the material has been different. Um, because for a long time, women lived very different and very circumscribed lives. They were dependent on their, um, you know, even, even if a woman was independent, she once she married, really up until really very recent, she lost control of all her assets. Uh, so the only way to hang on to them was to not marry. <laughs> um, so I don't know, it's too big a question. I think I would just let people, you know, let, let's all read the book. I've only just made it, you know, I've only just compiled this anthology. So it's actually far too, this kind of knowledge, answer to that question, you almost need to say, ask me again in five years. And I might then know, but at this point, I think the idea that just because I'm the person who's put the work together, Therefore, I'm an authority on it. I think that's false. Um, the Russian uh, director, filmmaker, um, oh, what was his name? Um, directed a film called The Sacrifice. Terrible famous. Tarkovsky uh, said a book read by a thousand different people is a thousand different books. And certainly with an anthology, I think because of that intermittent way of looking at the material that interests you, um, someone will come away with a certain picture of it and somebody else will carry away a completely different um, picture because people will gravitate to the work they like. I've put it in alphabetical order so I've ignored time. Um, I've tried to break, I mean the whole 
East Atlantic Archipelago rather than Britain and Ireland. I've tried to circumvent nationalism. I've tried to circumvent gender insofar as I can in that there aren't any men in it. But apart from that, um, you know, th I, I think of it more as the 50% of the population who are not generally credited with shaping this particular genre, um, rather than to sort of try and be quite so binary about it, because I think actually the world is a lot more complex than we allow. Yeah. Maybe men are louder than women. That might be one way of, you know, the voices are the ones that have traditionally been heard the most. So that might be another way of looking at it. Yes. Not. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting what you're saying. I think I will have to ask you back in five years' time if you've got time in your diary, so we can uh, <laughs> we can look at this. Oh, you know what I have just found? I found Tessa Boas's um, little piece on um, an extract from her beautiful book about Etta Lemon, who was the person who founded the RSPB. Would you like me to read it? I'd love you to. Thank oh, you, Kate. Because you're so intrigued. Here we are. Etta Lemon. This is from Tessa Boas's lovely book, Mrs. Pankhurst's Purple Feather. For 50 years, from the 1870s to the 1920s, wild bird species from around the world were systematically slaughtered for the millinery trade in one of the most lucrative commodity markets on earth. At its peak, the trade was worth a staggering 20 million pounds a year to Britain, around 200 million in today's money. In 1891, as the insatiable fashion for feathers stepped up yet another gear, two exclusively women's groups, one in Croydon, one in Manchester, banded together to save the birds. They gave themselves an ambitious title, the Society for the Protection of Birds, and their determination was rewarded with a Royal Charter in 1904. As the RSPB grew in scale and stature, so the men involved attempted to take charge. One remarkable woman who drove the anti-plumage campaign for the RSPB did so quietly and heroically for half a century, leading it to eventual victory. She campaigned so doggedly and for so long against what she called murderous millinery that she became known as mother of the birds. Her struggle to get the world to care about birds met with as much derision, contempt and indifference as Emmeline Pankhurst's fight for the vote. The millinery and the plumage trade demonized her as a frothy fanatic, a feather faddist. Right up until the First World War, the idea of bird protection was as laughable to the general population as the concept of female emancipation. She stuck to her convictions though, and she won her fight. The law was changed, plumage imports were banned, and the strange female fashion for avian adornment receded into the unimaginable past. Unlike Mrs. Pankhurst, she is today a forgotten figure, even within the RSPB. Not a plaque, not a portrait at the headquarters, not a mention in the canon of those women who helped shape the 20th century. Yet she has proved in her way to be as deeply influential to the modern psyche. Her name is Etta Lemon. She was militant right from the start. Shall I read on? Or leave it there? Yeah, I think yeah, people could uh, could get your book to read the rest of it. But I mean, there there you go. In in that piece there, it just tells you. For me, it tells me everything I need to know because the book, you know, the anthology you put together, meant something to me in that it it was a a window to another sort of dimension of, of writing which um, I suppose up until very recently wasn't really uh, wasn't really featured and it, I, I, I also think because of because I'm a black male in a world that isn't really my world in inverted commas because there's not many people like me I feel a great affinity whether it be sort of justified or not but I feel a great affinity to you know, groups of people like women and, you know, people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera, who are trying to make something in this world, it's conservation world, but are consistently kind of overpowered or basically controlled by the male aspect of it. Um, well, it's, it's very interesting that you say that, because I think that, you know, in the last couple of years, we've had a couple of, you know, strange, huge things. One was you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. And then obviously we've had COVID. Um, and then recently here in South London, we had the death of Sarah Everard. And I think of all those things, it was only finally the death of Sarah Everard that actually made me begin to understand um, quite how seismic the shift from Black Lives Matter has, has been. Because it's, it's really hard to 
to to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else and live and, and see how they live so you know you talk about being a black man in a in a you know essentially white um male world and i think for the women in that world we have just taken it for granted that we should sort of try and write like richard maybe and uh robert mcdonald melissa harrison has even written about when she first started writing she felt that she ought to sound more male uh in her writing uh or more genderless um and perhaps it's that you know perhaps it's because many of those people were academics and they wrote in a quite measured and formal manner um but when i first stopped putting this book together i actually began to panic because so little of the writing conformed to what we think of as nature writing and i thought oh heck you know do i do i start saying no actually i think you should write more, you know you should write more politically you know why aren't you writing about melting glaciers well you're writing about um the islands of britain and ireland so maybe we haven't got any glaciers but you, you know what i mean i i, I worried that th it isn't political enough uh, and one of the universities, I can't remember which one, has currently got a project going where they're actually seeking new voices in this kind of genre. And they've just come up with a short list of people. Um, I don't know if they have a prize or not. I honestly can't remember who it was. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but all of the people on the list were women, which they were very pleased about. And, uh, and there's a diversity of, of ethnicity amongst those women. Um, but they sort of say in their how we want what the kind of writing we're looking for that that a lot of nature writing if you like has been memoir based in the last few years and although that's valid um we're looking for something more political now i you know i, I was quite taken aback by that because that isn't how you get that isn't how breakthroughs are made by telling people what to write providing the space and providing the environment and actually providing the funding to allow people to go and explore ideas is how you'll get the best ideas. And this book is, as I say, I mean, I felt a bit like, who's that person who founded the Salvation Army, who put up that tent in um, East London? Um, <laughs> uh, they kept nicking the, the, you know, people keep nicking his tent pegs so that it fell down in the night. Um, but, you know, I've put my tent up on the village green and I've rolled up the sides like an old fashioned evangelist and said, come in and I want to hear what you have to say. And what has I've heard isn't necessarily what I expected to hear. Um, not everybody likes, you know, the natural world. There's a, a little extract from a, a farmer called Hannah Hawkswell, who those of you who are much older than me might remember from the 1970s when she was the star of a series of ITV documentaries. Um, she was a hill farmer in the Pennines, very near Barnard Castle, as it happens. And she lived alone without electricity or without water uh, and farmed alone um, until she was really quite old and became beloved of the nation, really. And when asked that, what did she think of the snow? And she looks at this beautiful landscape and she says, well, I hate it. I hate the cold. I understand that it has a certain beauty, but when it comes, and it gets into my bones and it gets into my fingers and I have to go out. I hate it. And you know, that's women on nature, you know, breaking the ice on her bucket to feed her cattle. Um, she's not saying, oh, it's all marvellous. Uh, Ten different words for snow, um, which the reason I mentioned that is there's a piece in here by Ali Smith, um, the Scottish writer who uh, parodies um, much of the writing that's uh, gone before the, shall i read it a little ali smith's little piece yeah absolutely i mean have you got by the way whilst we, have you got co the cover of the book at all oh yes yeah, should i hold it up and you see it it's yeah. very beautiful everybody it's full of my bookmarks i should take this up because it's extraordinarily beautiful very nice Other by um holly overton um so ali smith i think is kind of having a go at the um rst right PPST. Here we are, sorry. Can you tell her? Stevie Smith, Ali Smith, here we are. So this character has just taken over her boyfriend's Twitter account and hacked it. Charlotte is demeaning him and simultaneously making it look like he is demeaning his own followers. It is galling in so many ways. She knows it is. She is tweeting about snow specifically to be galling to him. 
She knows he has had everything planned, but he's been planning for quite some time for when it does properly snow, if it ever does again, for a piece about it in art in nature. He is, was, going to be riffing on the theme of footprints and alphabetical print. Every written letter making its mark, digital or ink on paper, is a form of track and animal score, a line that's been in his notebook for well over a year and a half. She knows full well he's been waiting because of the warm winter last year. He has such good words now, great words to conjure, trail, stamp, impress. He's also been collecting unusual words for snow conditions, lengthy, sposh, penitence. He is, was, going to get a bit political actually and talk about natural unity in seeming disunity, about how unity be, can be revealed against the odds by the random grace of snow's relationship with wind's direction. The way that when snow lands with an emphasis in one direction, even though a tree's branch is going so many directions. Charlotte thought this was a really lame idea and gave him a lecture about how he was missing the point that all but the very best and most politically aware nature writers were habitually self-satisfied and self-blinding and comforting themselves about their own identities in troubling times and that the word snowflake now had a whole new meaning and he should be writing about that. He's been making notes on the give and take of water molecule. He was going to subhead it generous water. He's been noting why, on a cold day, when there's very little breeze, something turning to ice will produce what looks like smoke, like a fire, and making notes about the combination of snow and ice called snice, with which buildings can be built because it's so strong, and about the feathery fern leaf shapes ice makes when it forms on some surfaces and doesn't on others, and how it's actually true that no two snow crystals are ever alike, and the difference between flake and crystal and the communal nature of the snowflake. That's also quite a political thing to write about, as well as how flakes falling from the sky are their own natural alphabet, forming their own unique grammar every time. Charlotte tore the pages out of the snow notebook and threw them out of the window of the flat. He'd looked out and seen what was left of them in the treetops and the bushes, on the windscreens and roofs of the cars parked underneath, blowing about on the pavement. So, you know, <laughs> parody, I think the, uh, you know, one of the things that, again, one has to be careful of is that uh, maybe nature writing was something that was close to, that it was easily parodied, um, yeah. as, as just done. And so she, I think, you know, what, what happens is that with these women, was that I've, I've got under the skin of a lot of things um, that surprised me. That, um, and, you know, yeah. to try redefine what it is that we're doing, really, what, what our relationship is with each other. Rather what, than it. what sort of legacy do you want this book to have? Do you want do you want this book to be encouraging other other women, female writers, so that maybe in a hundred years' time a similar type anthology would have travel a number of people writing? Well, I think you know one of the reasons that I, I wanted to make it the way I have is um, because a couple of years ago Tim D made a really lovely anthology called Common Ground. And um, I can't remember how many contributors there were, but maybe 15, and they were each writing essays. And he said either in the introduction or in an interview he, that um, he was aware that most of these writers were men and that all of them were white, but that it wasn't for want of asking. And I just thought, well, that can't be right, actually, that I, I'm going to, go and I'm going to look, you know, the question is, what are you calling nature writing? What are you calling writing about nature? So I don't call this nature writing. I call it writing by women on the natural world. Um, and it doesn't fit into that genre that we've come to recognize and think of um, that's become fashionable over the last decade in this country. Uh, reflecting, apart from anything else, a certain level of conservatism uh, in publishing. Um, think uh, um, the sorry I've got it let me quote it Suzanne Babineau's 2009 Simon Schuster after the crash uh, when also a lot of publishing houses put themselves on um, the stock market so they had investors uh, and she wrote it's a fine line to tread on the one hand we need to continue to take risks but the market itself will be more conservative it may be easier to say no to a book that we might have said yes to a few years ago. I think that sums up part of the reason for the conformity of what we've come to think of as writing about the natural world. Um, and uh, this book is made by Unbound, which is a crowdfunding platform because it's, you know, in all probability, it wouldn't have been, maybe it would have got the 
go ahead. Anthology is quite tricky to get off the ground anyway because there are so many people involved and they can be quite expensive to make. And this was quite expensive to make. Um, but no, I think the legacy is to just, as Michael Caine put it in um, the Italian job, am I allowed to swear? Yeah. Blow the bloody doors off. <laughs> We've had worse than that, by the way, in terms of uh, bad language, so yeah, it's not a problem. So, yeah, that's what I want to do, is, is, is change how we're thinking about what we're doing and change how we're thinking about ourselves. Um, that it's not us and the world, it, it's a system to which we all belong, which it is imperative we really do wake up and smell the coffee and realise how interconnected and interdependent we are. <laughs> that's what we've heard before on this site, but this is just a way, this book is one way of yeah. uh, using different art forms, including poetry, um, to yeah sorry it's, it's, it's funny but I, I don't get any phone calls or text messages and all of a sudden whilst i'm doing this everyone's ringing me um one question i want to sorry <laughs> i thought it was off um basically people i know for sure will be asking especially you know younger people looking at this now or in the future looking for advice as to how to to make a difference being a writer, um, would you have any advice for them at all? Um, I think my advice would be a plea to uh, publishers, really, to give people to, to pay writers. Writers are, you know, so woefully underfunded as a species. Because if you want original ideas out of people, you need to give them, you need to enable them to go away and sit down and think about their subject and just immerse themselves because that's where originality comes from not from trying to sort of fit things in between your day job this i have done over over three years and i'm sure it could have it would have been very different and would have happened a lot more quickly had i been funded paid to do it um but uh writers need to be valued so that's not advice for the writers that's advice or help to the publishers but while you have a system um, whereby um, there's, there's this level of conservatism and this need for profits uh, and no one is taking risks uh, I don't know how it can change I don't know it's, it's hard I was asked to come into a school to talk about becoming a, a career as a writer and I said well, writing isn't a career for most people you know the vast majority of writers don't make ends meet doing that so I don't know I, I may not be the answer that you want to hear but it is really hard to carve out you know, you've got brilliant people with brilliant minds um, who could be funded to to actually um, explore those ideas and I don't know I guess it's the same in several genres on look at TV for example you know they seem to invest in the same people and a lot of people yeah. who have talents and something else to offer um, if their face doesn't fit the kind of identikit, um, then they don't get a look in. It's a big problem because it means you have this perpetuation of something that's ultimately not working. Um, and I don't know how one... That, that's why I was sort of mentioning Black Lives Matter and Sarah Everard and COVID. You actually need giant things to get underneath and try and reset. Um, the worry is that now as we're coming out of this, everything's going to go back to how it was. And you know what about what about a post-growth economy? How about that? How about living with what we have? And um, I think it's imperative. I really do think it's important that people have ideas um, that will change. You know, literally blow the bloody doors off the whole way in which we live our lives in um, the industrialized nations, uh, because it's what well, you know. You know the effect that it's having on the natural world, which ultimately is on our survival. Um, so big ideas, you know, all this sort of Labour Party defeats uh, over Britain over the last, I don't know if you're interested in local politics in the UK anymore now that you don't have to live there. Um, but, you know, fancy having a national party that doesn't actually have a manifesto that anyone can recognise. We need ideas. We need ideas for everything. Yeah. Uh, but for conservation, that is the most important thing, I think, the world S saving the planet right yeah. now. I, I totally agree because I found in my career in this world conservation that um, ideas 
have been largely lacking and people um, have, um, some people I've been sort of, some NGOs I've been talking with over the years, lack foresight, lack creativity. And one of the things I'm afraid of is young people who are being molded by these conservation organizations um, to be images of how they see themselves, which to me means that you're not going to have any mavericks. It's not, you know, where are the mavericks? Where are the people that's who- it, That's the word, it's the mavericks. You need the original thinkers. Exactly, where are they? If you, if you don't encourage them from an early early start, start then you, there's problems. You see, there are some, as you know, absolutely brilliant ideas in conservation at the moment. Um, but one of the difficulties which I perceive, and maybe this is advice to writers, um, has to do with the language that is used. I mean, the number of times I have read um, a complaint or a comment under an article or on Twitter or something about, you know, why once again has The Guardian illustrated an article about upland um, pastures with some pictures, um, hay meadows with pictures of arable weeds or a grass verge. And that's all it says. And, and Joe Public is looking at that thinking, well, hang on, what, what, what's, a, what's a hay meadow? What's an arable weed? What's, what are wildflowers? What are, you know, there's no attempt to actually embrace uh, the fact that most of the world, the people you need to care about you, the pe which is everyone else, they don't actually know what you're talking about. So, so this um, being prepared to, as it were, um, jump the fence and embrace a wider readership, a general readership, uh, is something that I think is very important because otherwise, you know, conservation remains speaking to the same few people, talking to the converted, going around. Um, it's like train spotting in a. I mean that in the politest possible way, but we need to embrace everyone because our survival. I'll tell you, I went to Costa Rica about two years ago and I was absolutely amazed because every single hotel that I went to, and every little taverna, every little sort of tiny place, the person on reception is probably going to be a young person, probably a student, and you'd ask a question about where can I see um, those little red frogs that are poisonous, what they call poison dart frogs. You know, where yeah. are like poison dart frogs? And they would it, they would speak with the authority of you know an undergraduate in botany. And if you go into a hotel in the Lake District and ask somebody um, a question about local topography, the young people who are employed in our hotels have no idea. They know nothing whatsoever about. Um, the physical place in which they find themselves. And it's, a, you know, we have a huge amount to learn from somewhere like Costa Rica. I would say all eyes go to Costa Rica and look at Costa Rica um, because that tiny country is 97% sustainable. Um, and the other 3% is all petrol cars. Uh, it's, it got rid of its army in 1949 because then it can't have any wars. And um, it's allowed its rainforest to pop back with astonishing um, speed by the farmers deciding to take their cattle off the land and um, allow the rainforest to come back funded by the government. Um, it, it's a jewel, but, but it's really the way in which young people are able to talk and converse about the wildlife uh, that is on their doorstep. What to direct you to see when you go out and look up at the trees. And you know, the really interesting thing is that they, when you go into the rainforest, they don't say the animals, they say the people. They'll say, you'll see the people, some of them are quite small. You may have to look. And it's a completely different way of, you know, the, that, that boundary between us and them is not there. And it, that I found really heartwarming. Yeah. Um, and yet it's unfortunately, it's, it's small in Wales, I think. Um, yeah. so, you know, it is a really tiny little country, uh, but we have much to learn. Yeah, the, sorry, the disconnect is just incredible in terms of the you know the, the modern western world compared to elsewhere you know people are growing up not knowing anything and you know in britain having words chopped out of the library that reflect natural history and our past like acorn and what have you to be replaced by these modern it's just it's just very sad to be honest but but uh but yeah, kate we this. <laughs> i was just gonna say we could uh, we could talk all night. We've only just started warming up. I can feel it, but we've actually nearly 
done an hour of conversation. So I just wanted to ask you um, to name your favorite mammal. Uh, well, I hope it's not controversial. It probably is. I, I love controversy. Um, well, it's a fox. Um, and it's partly because, as I say, I grew up in a green belt where a fox was an elusive thing that I never saw. And then when I came to live in London, uh, I mean, they are everywhere. And, and certainly when I was, you know, but for some reason, when I, when I was sick, when, when I first moved back to London from Barcelona, um, this fox would sit outside our house every day. And if, when I went to the supermarket, it would sort of walk ahead of me a bit and stop and sit down. Uh, and it just became kind of totemic. I like the fact that they can live anywhere, that they will adapt to their habitats. Um, I think it's extraordinary that they're the nearest thing that we have really to a wild animal. To uh, We don't have wolves anymore. We don't have, you know, all the extraordinary variety of four-legged furry um, mammals that other nations have. Uh, and yet they seem to be everybody's enemy. Um, but I love them. I think they're, they're, they're like, they, they, they seem to sort of straddle the veil between this world and something a little more numinous and a little more mysterious. Fantastic. And if you could be anywhere on this planet, notwithstanding the current pandemic, where would it be? Oh, it would be the south coast of Crete. Um, Crete is an extraordinary island, as you know, I'm sure, I don't know if you've been there, but the Greek islands, the, they, the sea goes straight up into the mountains, and um, there are so many varieties of herbs. There's this thing called Greek mountain tea, which is just, you know, you can sleep like a log. It's so full of wildlife. It's so alive. It's so vibrant. It's an extraordinary place um, uh, from the point of view of both botany and birds and insects. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, Zoomers, just to let you know, guys, that there's a couple more uh, in conservations with coming until the end of the season, the current season at the end of June. So on Thursday, the 27th, we have a guy called James Lowen here, and he'll be talking about his book on moths. Much Ado About Mothing is the name of his book. So he'll be talking about moths. On the 31st of May, um, there's a guy called Les Stroud, who is um, the Canadian's answer to um, um, Bear Grylls, in a way. But he'll be talking about surviving in nature, which could be quite interesting if you're stuck somewhere. Um, on June the 7th, Monday, June the 7th, we've got a guy called Charlie Corbett. And he will be talking about his book, which is called 12 Birds to Save Your Life. So that could be, in fact, that will be interesting. And on the 28th of June, we've got Joe Shute, who's a journalist and um, very interested in, in nature. And he's written a book about the weather. What do we know? What do you know about the weather, actually? So we'll be talking about the weather. And we've got a few more people coming up as well. They'll be on the website shortly, including a guy called Sam Lee, who has written a book on nightingales. So we'll be talking all things nightingale with him. And there's another guy called jo Johan Jensen, who um, is one of the key lights in the Batumi raptor count. And Batumi is in Georgia, and he'll be talking about all the raptors that drift overhead, a million birds every autumn. It's just incredible, fantastic. So, Kate, um, once again, thank you so much for accepting the invitation to talk about your, your wonderfully illustrated book, but also wonderful book in terms of the content and the writers within so thank you very much for being I, here i just want to say that some i know i can see sally goldsmith here um that you that i think some of our writers may well be here in your oh fantastic uh, Fan Fan <laughs> fantastic and zoomers once again uh thank you so much for for being here tonight this afternoon good morning and this morning as well um look forward to seeing you again on another in conservation with um i'm david lindo and it's left for me to say, keep looking up.